have a Bible, uh, would you please turn to 1 John chapter 5? We're just going to be reading two verses today, but if you could, uh, and if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's Word as we read 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. It'll be up there on the screen if I didn't give you enough time to flip there. But 1 John 5, 11 through 12 says this, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Life. Pray with me real quick before we go any further. Dear God, I just thank you for your word and the truth that we can find in it. And God, I pray that today as we we learn more about this eternal life that you have given us, God, that, that we would embrace it and that we would not just wait until we die to experience the life that you have given us. In your name I pray, amen. All right, you guys can all be seated. And who all this morning can genuinely believe that this is the last day of 2023. I feel like this year has flown by. Uh, It's been a very eventful one, uh, not just uh, personally, but for the church as a whole, right? We've had a lot going on. Uh, And so one thing that I like to do from week to week with our middle school students is I love to ask them, did you have a thumbs up kind of week or a thumbs down kind of week? And so what we're gonna do this morning is we're gonna extend that a little bit. And I'm gonna ask you guys to be honest in this room this morning. And I wanna know, would you rank your 2023 as a thumbs up kind of year or a thumbs down kind of year? Now you fully have the option to lie to the person next to you, but you know, I wouldn't advise it, right? And so uh, I'm gonna look around the room, but if you can look back at this year and you would say, you know what, it was a pretty good year, I'm gonna give it a thumbs up. Let me see those thumbs right now, let me see. All right, where are my thumbs down at? Anybody, anybody got a thumbs down? All right, we got the brave souls that did it. Who's, who are my middle schoolers that are indecisive and just threw this up? (laughs) Right, anybody like that? Okay, all right, right? So. I I ask this question because I know that all of us this past year probably had a moment or two where things seemed great, right? Where everything seemed right in the world, nothing was going wrong, and then all of a sudden, something bad happened, and, and, and we might have completely forgotten about the good that we just saw. And really what happens a lot of the time in our lives is we end up judging the quality of life based off of the circumstances that we are immediately in. Right, and, and really when we look around our world today, we have people struggling with depression and anxiety and all of these, these issues because the world is broken and we are in terrible circumstances from week to week to week. And the, the bummer of it all is that this isn't just an American problem, it's not just a worldwide problem, it's an entire history of the world problem. Right, people have always struggled with looking at the quality of life that they have. And so today what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking in 1 John, and just like this past month where we've been looking at this letter that that a John who is growing older and older is making sure that truth is being passed down to the church. And, and what we just read today in verses 11 and 12 is really part of a section of scripture in which John is attempting to combat false teaching. He, he's trying to push back against teaching that he knows is not true. And so he's ultimately defending the truth in these verses that we see. And so what he does is he brings clarity and truth to the situation. And the beauty of God's word, the beauty of scripture is that not only did it bring clarity to this group of people in this particular of time, it can bring truth and clarity to us today. And so what I want us to to attempt to learn from this passage this morning is this thought that God has proven that we have eternal life through his son alone, which means that in 2024, we as Christians, we can live this life confidently and we can share God's testimony with urgency. And so what I wanna do is I wanna to back up a little bit because at the beginning of verse 11, we are introduced to uh, this phrase in which John says, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And so when he's introducing this idea of testimony, really what he's doing here is he is introducing this idea of God's proof. He is saying, hey, God has given us proof of what I'm about to tell you. And so what we need to do is really imagine ourselves as we start reading verses 11 and 12 as if we are walking into 
into a courtroom in which John is already in the process of defending a case, right? So, so we have entered into a courtroom, and in those days, just like today, uh, in, in the Roman uh, law system, in the Jewish law system, the, the best case scenario is for you to have multiple witnesses when you come into court. And so what, what John does earlier on in verses six through 10 is he introduces these witnesses. But before we get to that, we need to know what he's arguing against, right? We, we need to know what he is combating. And so in these days, this idea started to spread, these false teachers and lies started to spread that when Jesus was born, Right, we celebrated this last week, but when Jesus was born, this false teaching was that Jesus was simply a man. That, that he wasn't God made flesh, he was just a man. And then when Jesus grew up and he was baptized, it was at that moment when God entered into the man of Jesus and Jesus became both man and God. But then performing miracles and teaching and all of these things right before Jesus dies on the cross, God decided to say, I'm out and just left and Jesus died just as a man. And so this false teaching was known as Gnosticism back in that day. And we know, based off of scripture that we read, that this cannot be true, right? We celebrated it last week, that, that when Jesus came, he was God in the flesh, and he lived life as a baby, as a kid, as a teenager, all the way through, and he died on the cross for our sins. God died on our behalf, but not only did he die, he conquered death and rose again, right? We have this hope, and we have this truth, but John is having to come bat against this false teaching that is spreading around in the world. And so, like I said, John picks out three witnesses that he wants to bring into the courtroom. He brings forward the water, the blood, and the spirit. In, in verses six through 10, it, it, or uh, just in verse uh, six, it says this, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the spirit is the one who testifies because the spirit is the truth. And I'm gonna do my best to, to try to break that down because it's pretty confusing right there. But just like in the, it, like I said earlier, in the Roman legal system, in the Jewish legal system, and in today's legal system, the more witnesses that you bring into court, the, the better chance you have of defending your position. Uh, I've never been in, in a courtroom. I've never been uh, accused of anything uh, to that degree, right? And so uh, I don't really have much experience in a courtroom, but I do have a lot of experience watching TV. And so this is kind of what I'm bringing forward. <laughs> This is what I got for you guys today. And so uh, in, in every TV show, I usually see like these witnesses strutting down uh, in, in the courtroom and all of a sudden the, the whole case changes. And so John puts on his lawyer hat and he says, these are the witnesses that I'm bringing into the room. And so the, the ones that he first introduces are the water and the blood. And the reason why he introduces these two is because they are critical to the false teaching of Gnosticism. Right, so he brings forward the water, which when he's talking about the water, he's talking about the baptism of Jesus, this moment where Jesus was baptized, and we see both the Holy Spirit and God the Father show up in that moment, but then we also have Jesus' death on the cross. And so what John is saying here is yes, when Jesus was baptized, he was fully God. When Jesus died, he was fully God. He's, he's pointing out the errors in this Gnostic belief in these moments. And so John is a really cool guy to be bringing up these points though, because not only was he a disciple of Jesus who might've just heard these stories, he was a guy who was likely there for Jesus's baptism. When you read scripture, you learn that John wasn't just the disciple of Jesus, he was also a disciple of John the Baptist beforehand, and he was likely there for this baptism of Jesus. He would have seen all of the events take place, but then also, John was very clearly there at the death of Jesus. And so John isn't just speaking as a guy who's heard stories about Jesus. He's speaking as a guy who has walked where Jesus has walked, walked right beside him and saw all of these major events take place. And so John is a really cool eyewitness that is bringing forward all of these points. But then not only does he bring up these first two witnesses, he introduces his star witness. He brings forward the spirit. He's pretty much saying, hey, 
if you don't believe me who saw all of this stuff happened, you can believe God because he's saying what I'm saying, right? And so he introduces the spirit uh, in this conversation saying that the Holy Spirit has revealed himself to us, allowing us to know that Jesus was in fact who he said he was. And this is a great reminder of what we talked about last week on Christmas, right? We talked about this idea that love came first, right? That, that Jesus entered into the world and, and was proactive, showing up, there was nothing on our behalf that we did to earn Jesus. We couldn't love Jesus on our own. So Jesus showed up and loved us first. And so not only did Jesus love us first, but he revealed himself to us. There would be no way for us to have a right relationship with God unless God showed up and God revealed himself to his people. And so we can love because God first loved us. We learned that last week, but we can live because Jesus lives today. Right? We have confidence that Jesus rose from the dead and he lives today. And because he lives, we can have confidence in this life. Right? And so the, John says something very interesting in verse 12. He says, whoever has the son has life. And, and what's critical here is, is John doesn't write that whoever has the son will have life. He's saying that right now in our possession, if we know Jesus, we have eternal life. And, and what, what I notice is that oftentimes in Christianity, I see a lot of Christians that are waiting to die to experience eternal life. Right? A lot of Christians out there are just saying, oh, well, I know that this life is messed up, but I'm just waiting for the second chance that I get now because of Jesus. But that's not what Jesus came and died for in, in one of John's previous writings in his Gospel of John in chapter 10, verse 10. He says, uh, John is writing what Jesus preached in which Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus didn't just die for us to get a second shot at life. Jesus died on the cross so that we can have eternal life right here and right now. So what do I mean by that? I mean that eternal life is not simply talking about the quantity of years that we're gonna live. But what it's talking about is the quality of life that we have right now. Right? And in these past couple weeks, we, we've looked at these ideas of, of joy and peace and hope and love and all of these things, if this is true, are a part of the eternal life that we receive when we pray to receive Jesus. So right in the moment that we get on our knees, we repent of our sin and we accept Christ, we have received the eternal life that brings peace, joy, hope, and love. And what I'm not saying here is that when we accept Christ, everything's gonna be sunshine, rainbows, and lollipops, right? We still live in a world of brokenness and hurt. There are gonna be moments in our life where anxiety can feel uh, overwhelming. There's gonna be moments where sickness brings sadness into our life, right? We can look around at the state of the world and we have doubt and we lose all of our hope and that the broken relationships that we see around us make us feel like love is all but gone. And so if our only focus is on these circumstances that we walk around, these circumstances that we see, ultimately, life is gonna be awful. If all you're doing is looking at the things that are happening to you, you will never have a great quality of life because the world is broken and it is full of hurt and hurting people. And so we are always gonna be dragged down by our circumstances. But this is why John clarifies and says, this, son, uh, this life is in God's son. And so apart from Christ, there is no peace. Apart from Christ, there is no hope, there is no joy, there is no love. Apart from Christ, we do not have the eternal, uh, eternal life that God has promised. And when difficult circumstances arise, we have a constant source of confidence because we know that Jesus Christ has already claimed victory, right? And so how many of you guys are big roller coaster people? I asked this question in the first service and was surprised at how little people were, but uh, who, who's, a, who's a big fan of roller coasters, all right? So when, when I was uh, growing up, uh, I was never a massive fan of roller coasters, right? Um, I, I was a little bit scared today. I'm a big fan. I'll ride any of the rides, but uh, what, what I've learned 
uh, is that roller coasters are pretty fun. I've also learned that I'm too big for some roller coasters and I can no longer ride them. But uh, I really do enjoy roller coasters, but there was one moment in my past where uh, we were going to Busch Gardens, our family went up, and uh, while I was walking towards um, the, the park, I see this blue and yellow roller coaster. All right, and, and this thing, is called Montu. It's this roller coaster called Montu. And for me, when I saw this thing, um, I got pretty scared, all right? So uh, looking at this ride, it goes upside down like eight times or something like that. And so I, I, was, I was pretty scared in this moment, but my dad asked me, he said, hey, do you want to ride Montu? And I said, absolutely not. Look at that thing, it goes upside down eight times. And so my dad, um, being the manly man that he is, he just walked into the line without me. And so I walked over to the lockers with my mom and I sat down there and we just looked at people checking in their backpacks. Um, but what I also did during this time was I watched my dad go up on the incline um, and I watched him go down. This is a pretty good view of, of what I was looking at. And he looped around and went all the way through. And so as I'm watching these things happen, uh, I'm sitting there, my dad doesn't show up, he doesn't show up, but then he walked down the stairs and I, I was fine. But the first thing that came into my mind when I saw my dad was I walked up to him and I said, hey, I wanna ride Montu, right? And, and in that situation, looking back at it, it's pretty dark, honestly, because I was willing to let my dad be the sacrificial lamb to this roller coaster. <laughs> Right, I said, hey, if you die on this thing, I know I was right about not riding it, but so what I did uh, was I, I ended up riding it and I loved it and I had a blast, but I was able to ride that roller coaster only because I saw that my dad had already gone through the incline, he had already gone through the eight loops, he had experienced all of it, and the same goes for our lives here on earth. Right? We, we can confidently live our lives here on earth because Jesus has walked where we have walked. Right? Jesus was tempted the same ways that we were tempted. Right? As the middle school pastor, this crosses my mind every once in a while, but Jesus went through the most brutal thing every human goes through, and that was puberty, right? And so Jesus went through puberty at some point as well. So Jesus has gone through everything that we have experienced. And this is why the proof that John pointed to earlier is so very important because what the Gnostics were believing here, they were saying that Jesus didn't live from a baby to adulthood. They're just saying that, that Jesus as God was only there for three years on earth, which means that we do not have a high priest that we can relate to. But because Jesus lived, because he experienced every aspect of human life, now, we can have hope and we can have confidence in that. Uh, as the middle school pastor, I don't often get to quote Charles Spurgeon because he doesn't have a TikTok or anything, but Charles Spurgeon, uh, writing on uh, this passage right here, he said uh, this. He said that many go to heaven with very little comfort on the road. I do not commend them for their lack of comfort, but I do advise you, instead of looking to singular experiences as a ground of confidence, look to the bleeding Savior and rest alone in him. For if you have him, you have eternal life. And so what, what Spurgeon is saying here is he's saying that Christians throughout all of history have gone through difficult moments. And, and when we look back at these difficult moments, they can bring us happiness and joy, but truly they won't ultimately bring true confidence because when we look back at those moments, they're just temporary. But we have an eternal hope and we have an eternal confidence and that is the person and the life of Jesus Christ. And so in Jesus, we have that confidence. And if you have the son, you have life, not when you die, but you have it right now. And Jesus and God, they don't want you to just wait until you die to experience that life. They want you to experience that life right here and right now. And the best way that you can experience eternal life, the best way that you can experience the life that Jesus died for is by leading others to the life that you now have. Which is why at the end of verse 12, when, when John says, whoever has the son has life, Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. He is presenting an urgent situation that we find ourselves in, and we must now share God's testimony with urgency in our lives. 
Right, and I, I bring up verse 12 because sometimes when, when I'm reading scripture, I like to, to read it through the lens of a middle schooler, right? Because that's part of my job. And as I read uh, verse 12, whoever has the son has life. Hoorah, I have the son. This is great. This is awesome. And then whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Those are the people I point and laugh at because I have something that they don't have. But what John is writing here, he is not writing for us to brag about the life that we have. Right, as, as a student pastor here, I've gotten the chance to go to a lot of our student camps, right? I grew up here and I, I loved student camp as a student, uh, but I love it even more as the student pastor. And you could assume that it's because I get to run all of these big, massive games and plan all this amazing stuff. And that's part of it. I, I love having fun at camp. Uh, another uh, aspect that you might think is why I love camp is because I get to speak with a, with a guest speaker and we get to map out where uh, we want to take the students and, and have them grow spiritually. And that's probably the second best part of, of being the student pastor at camp. But, but the number one best part of being student pastor at camp is the fact that the students have to walk from point A to point B in the summer heat and I get a golf cart, all right? That's the number one best thing about student camp as student pastor because there, there's something unique that when earlier in the day, when you're at breakfast, a middle schooler just back talks you or gives you sass, and then a couple hours later, they're like in the summer heat, barely chugging their water bottle, and you just get a cruise by them, blasting music on the golf cart, it heals the soul, it really does. <laughs> and it feels good. And so I, I love being the student pastor at camp, but sometimes what I do, uh, because um, I'm obligated as a, a pastor, is sometimes I show grace and I show mercy, right? And so what I'll do is when I see a group of students, you know, barely making it to rec, I'll pull over and I'll let them jump onto the golf cart, right? And so as we start moving, the funny thing that happens is, is we start passing other students. And usually, the reaction of the kids on the golf cart in that moment are to start pointing and laughing at the kids that are walking. <laughs> and I'm sitting there in the front seat going, the only reason why you're getting a ride is because I let you on, right? You, you didn't do anything worth bragging about. And so in these moments, I think, man, what, what are they bragging about? What, what right do they have? And then I realize that sometimes that's how we treat the life that we have in Christ. Right? All of us have started off trudging along through the hurt and the brokenness of the world. All of us have had a point in our lives where we have felt hopeless, where we're at the end of our rope, where we have nothing left, and then by the grace of God, a golf cart pulls up, right? And Jesus is in the front seat, and he lets us hop on board, he invites us to hop on board, and he gives us eternal life. But then what happens is, is we're going through life and we have this, this eternal life, this joy, this confidence in which we can live in. What happens is, is when we pass by people who are trudging along in their brokenness and their hurt and their pain, we forget that we were once in their shoes. And really what John is doing here is he's clarifying that we don't have anything to brag about. All that has happened in this situation is that we have accepted the gift of Christ and they haven't done it yet, right? And so he introduces this, this urgency of the world that we live in. We should be encouraged by the fact that we have confidence in this life, that we have life in Christ, but there are plenty of people living who don't have that confidence. There are plenty of people who feel trapped by the weight of their burdens and the weight of the world. And so the only way that most of these people are going to experience the life that Christ has to offer is if we get serious and we realize the urgency of the situation and we tell them about the life that we have. And so earlier, as we walked into this courtroom with John, he introduces the three witnesses, the water, the blood, and the spirit. But if you claim to be a follower of Christ, you have now joined those witnesses. Your life is now a living testimony to God. And so Galatians 2.20, it, it says this, that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so what this verse is saying is it's saying, hey, it's not about me anymore. 
When I accept Christ, I acknowledge it's not about me making sure that my name is known, making sure that I'm always comfortable or making sure that I'm the center of everything. It's now about Christ. It's about making sure that he is known and Christ living in us. And just as we have eternal life through Jesus alone, we can also live our lives because the spirit dwells within us, right? If we didn't have the Holy Spirit in us, walking beside us, this life would be impossible. But if you are a Christian, you are now a living testimony of a living God to a dying world. And that is a urgent call on our lives. And so God has tasked us with going out into the world and being his living testimony. And so when we preach and, and, and we bring up this idea of being Naples to the nations, we're not just talking about the things that happen here on campus. We're not just talking about the one day a year of love Naples. What we're talking about is we are talking about every single person in this room, in the chapel, online, all of us going out into the nations and being living testimonies wherever we go. And so, love your neighbors. Bring joy to those that are sick. Preach the hope of Christ to those who are at the end of their rope and be peacekeepers or, and peacemakers wherever you go. Right? Another thing that I get the privilege of doing is I get to work with a, a great next-gen family ministry team in which Joanne works with our preschool, Jess works with our kids, and I work with our students, and Pastor Greg kind of runs around all over the place, right? And so in these moments, all four of us love investing in the next generation, but there's no way that we can, we can invest in every single student that walks in through these doors. And one way that you can easily be a living testimony is just by showing up right here on our campus and loving those kids and those students and raising up the next generation of witnesses for God, right? But maybe you are someone in this room, someone listening that as I've been speaking about this life, so I've been speaking about this eternal life and quality of life that we can have. All that you've been thinking about is, well, I'm still trapped. The world feels so heavy that there's no hope for me. And, and what scripture tells us is that if you feel burdened by everything going on in the world, throw it on Jesus and he will make your burdens light. Put your faith and trust in Christ. Repent of your sin. Turn away from whatever keeps on leading you back to brokenness, which will be everything but Jesus, and turn to him and receive the gift of eternal life through Christ. So one major thing that I want everyone in this room to realize is that the way in which we live our lives in the year of 2024 will affect someone's view of God for all of eternity, right? If you claim to be a believer, you are now a representation of God in the world around you. You ought to be bringing life into situations. And what I mean by this is, hey, maybe if you're praying before your meal at a restaurant, there's probably an indication there that a waiter might pick up on it and go, they're probably Christian or religious in some, in some way. And then if you start yelling at that same waiter when your cheeseburger has tomatoes on it and you ask for no tomatoes, guess what? They are gonna have a poor view of God because of the way that you have acted. Amen. Maybe when you go into uh, your, your kid's school and every day you pull up at, at drop-off and you have that first Naples church logo uh, bumper sticker on the back of your car, and you start yelling at teachers or, or giving them sass back, guess what? You have now shown them a poor image of God. And so all of us in the world that we live, in the lives that we live, we are now beacons of light and life to those all around us. And we need to recognize that. And we need to take that seriously because of the urgency of this call, that there are people dying every day going to hell because they do not know of the life that Jesus brings. And so I'll close with this, that a year from today, if Pastor Allen lets me get up here on stage and preach again, right? If a year from today, I were to ask you to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down to determine how your 2024 went, I would hope that wherever your thumb landed, it wouldn't be dependent on the circumstances that you got caught up in that year. But it would, it would reflect 
ultimately the lives that you know were changed because you took being a witness of God seriously in the world around you. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for the life that we have, that God, you, you did not call us to live this life in apathy, but God, you've given us an urgent call to go forth and make sure that your truth is known. And so God, I, I thank you for the life that you've given each and every one of us, and I pray I pray that if there's anyone in this room who has not yet accepted that gift, that they would, they would repent of their sin and that they would turn towards you because God, you are generous in the life that you give and it is endless that you can provide God. So Lord, be with each and every one of us as we enter into the year of 2024. Let us be living witnesses of who you are. In your name I pray, amen.